uh, 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 welcome uh, to our last and fin our final seminar of the South Asia series for the spring Inno semester. Uh, we are very fortunate to end it with a bang uh, with a talk from our own Sam Asher, who joined uh, International Economics at SAIS as faculty uh, in 2019. And prior to that, he was at the World Bank. And before that, he was a postdoc at Nuffield in Oxford after finishing his PhD at Sir Harvard. Uh, Sam's been working on a range of issues. Uh, some of his work, uh, especially, is on India. Uh, he's also set up this sort of data lab uh, with just sort of amazing amounts of data for as a as a sort of public good, uh, which is which is really a, a very sort of welcome for all of us. Uh, I'll turn it over to Sam, and uh, then uh, after, um, uh, I think the if you have questions, just uh, during his talk, uh, set it, send it in the Q and A. Uh, I think this format is a bit awkward, so try and hold on till the till he till he finishes, unless you have something very very pressing, and if so, you can in interrupt. Uh, Sam, if that works for you, the, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks so much, Devesh, and uh, let me start my video. Okay, let's share the screen and okay, everyone can see that? Yep. Great, uh, well, thanks very much for this opportunity to present. Um, this is work in progress. Um, we're gonna be coming out with a new draft of this paper very soon. And so this is a terrific time to be getting feedback from all of you. As Devish said, um, feel free to interrupt me if there's something urgent. Otherwise, I'll try to finish by one o'clock and make sure that we have like 15 minutes for discussion because I'm keen to hear from everybody. So as broad motivation, um, there's just this growing literature in economics and elsewhere showing just how very important uh, location is as a determinant of opportunity. Where you grow up matters, where you live matters for the kinds of jobs that you have access to, for the education that you receive, for who you marry, and so on. Um, this has been much more studied in rich countries than in poorer countries. Um, and in particular, the sort of neighborhood level high resolution characteristics of cities in the rapidly growing uh, urban areas in lower and middle income countries of the world are just much, much less studied than equivalent neighborhoods in rich countries. Um, I would argue that this has been in large part due to a paucity of data. Uh, generally speaking, kinds of data sets that researchers can get access to in poorer countries um, are often uh, at very high levels of geographic aggregation or when you have microdata, um, you don't know exactly where that, that data is coming from. Um, and that makes it quite difficult to study issues of, uh, of neighborhoods and, and segregation. Um, and so what we're gonna do in this paper is we're going to create um, a data set based on multiple censuses of over 1 million neighborhoods in both rural and urban India. Um, and we're gonna study settlement patterns, who lives where, as well as how does that affect the access to public goods uh, that group get. Um, we're gonna particularly focus on two marginalized groups in India, uh, as castes and Muslims. And then we're gonna ask this big overarching question of are the inequalities and settlement patterns that we observe in rural India that we think have been there for a very long time being reproduced in India's growing cities? Um, and the answer is broadly gonna be yes. Um, so what do we find? Well, we find that, that Muslims and especially scheduled castes are highly segregated in both rural India and in urban India. Um, the rural segregation patterns that we observe are being almost precisely replicated one for one in urban neighborhoods, in nearby urban areas. Um, we find that neighborhoods with high numbers of marginalized groups with a high population share coming from scheduled castes and from Muslims um, ha experience worse access to public goods. This is particularly true for Muslims. So Muslims are, are simultaneously less segregated than scheduled castes, but when uh, they are found in very high concentrations in these neighborhoods. Those neighborhoods are much worse served by government health and educational facilities. These numbers are much worse than 
more aggregated data would suggest. Um, this is very much a very local phenomenon. Um, so it's not necessarily the case that like states or districts that have a high number of Muslims necessarily have much worse provision overall, but it doesn't matter to me necessarily that, that there's a school 20 kilometers away. What matters to me is can my kids walk to that school? Um, and what we find is that when we zoom down to the very local level, that there are these very stark inequalities that are predicted by uh, particularly the share of the location that is Muslim. Um, and this is, we're gonna talk about this in the context of the broader literature, which is particularly developed in the United States. But of course, India's settlement and segregation patterns are unique. Um, a couple of differences in, with the US. One is that uh, all groups are poorer in more segregated areas. In the US, it, it tends to be the case that uh, minority groups, particularly African-Americans are poorer in more segregated areas, but the dominant groups, uh, which are whites, are not. In India, everybody's poorer when there's more segregation. Um, we're also finding that segregation is, is still very high in the youngest cities, but, but less severe than it is in, in older cities. Okay, um, I probably don't need to give as much context on marginalized groups in India to this audience as I do normally in econ seminars, um, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page, uh, we're going to be focusing on two marginalized groups in India, in particular, scheduled castes and Muslims. Uh, scheduled castes are approximately 17% of the Indian population, and they are officially designated, they are on government schedules, that's where the word schedule comes from, um, and designated to receive various constitutional and, and protections and policy benefits. Um, this is, these are groups that the caste system has repressed for centuries, um, where, which has enforced occupational, residential, and, and social segregation on these groups. Um, but now in modern India, there are various protective arrangements and affirmative action programs trying to uh, facilitate mobility, upward mobility by these groups. Um, in contrast, Muslims, a pretty similar percentage of the Indian population, 14%, this is the second largest Muslim population in the world after Indonesia, um, are considered more urban um, and historically have been in more privileged positions than scheduled castes, but there's a growing body of evidence that they're really falling behind in modern India. Um, they tend to be politically underrepresented, um, low levels of educational attainment, and I'll talk about a little bit of evidence from, from another paper that we have on their upward mobility. Note that we are not studying scheduled tribes in this paper. Uh, scheduled tribes are the other major grouping of marginalized groups that um, often get studied in contexts like this. Um, given that we're particularly interested in whether India's rural disparities are being reproduced in its urban areas, um, there's such a small percentage of the urban population, and there's already a lot to present on scheduled castes and Muslims that we're going to save this for future work. So it's not that what's happening to them is not important, um, just that it doesn't fit so well into this paper. So in the US, there's this very developed literature on, on segregation. Um, and they generally split the causes into these three categories, self-segregation by marginalized groups, um, either for protection or for other reasons uh, living uh, apart, uh, collective exclusion, uh, which is not being allowed to live in areas with other groups, and then white flight, where the dominant group leaves a particular neighborhood when it gets above a certain uh, percent. Uh, African-American in the case of the U.S. Um, now, there, in the U.S., there's this history of discriminatory laws, such as redlining and remnants, that have actually enforced this segregation. Um, those are no longer allowed, but ha have left their, their fingerprints all over American history. Um, we do know uh, there's various, mostly qualitative evidence that ethnic enclaves in the US have recreated many features of rural life in origin countries, like this particular study of uh, Boston's North End and Sicilians in, in that neighborhood. Um, we do also know that feedback loops can generate these tipping points and high levels of segregation. Um, there's a, an economics literature, particularly in the last decade or so, that has been studying the migration of black migrants from the US South to the more industrial cities of the North referred to as the Great Migration, um, where despite fleeing really horrible conditions in the South, they still entered into very segregated conditions in the cities of the North. Um, and that actually the influx of these migrants increased segregation and police spending and, and lowered intergenerational mobility. We also know from other work that segregation is associated with lower mobility and the, the work of Raj Chetty and others um, using tax data in the US um, also low black birth weight and a vari various other negative outcomes for uh, the African-Americans who, who are experiencing high levels of segregation. 
Now in India, most of the literature is qualitative, um, particularly on Muslim ghettoization and economic disadvantage. Um, from the Sutra Committee, which was this flagship government report, um, they did actually find that more Muslim villages have more have fewer public goods, but um, the data was never released and it was done in, in such a, a sort of crude way that it's very, very difficult to tell, is this about local variation or is this about broad regional patterns? Um, we do see in, in some other work by Banerjee and Somanathan that uh, across regions, both Muslims and scheduled castes tend to live in regions that have relatively lower public goods, um, though there's been some equalization of those goods over time. But as I argued earlier, we're really interested in what's happening at the very, very local level because we think that actually um, it's misleading when we call these goods public goods because they're really only available to people who live very locally. I can only go to a health center if I can actually reach it. I can only send my kids to a school if it's very nearby. Um, there is evidence on the importance of proximity to jobs and networks for the urban poor in India that suggests that where people live, the exact neighborhoods that people live in within cities may be really consequential. Um, there was some work done on this link between segregation and communal violence in Ahmedabad, um, though that agenda hasn't really gone forward, I would argue, probably due to a lack of data. Um, there is a very rich series of papers by Bharati and others um, on segregation at the, the same spatial resolution that we're going to be studying here. Um, they do characterize high levels of caste and Muslim segregation in urban Karnataka, in one state in, uh, in southern India. Um, they do find high levels of SC and ST segregation in five cities um, across the country, and then some mixed results on this relationship between village diversity and, and public goods. Um, but we argue in this paper that overall there's relatively little evidence on this association between urban location on the one hand, but the actual public goods that you're getting access to and the economic outcomes that you're experiencing. And that's what we're gonna, we're gonna try to connect all of those things in this paper across the entirety of both rural and urban India. So I just wanted to give you a couple of pictures of um, what segregation neighborhoods can look like in India. This may be unnecessary for a, a, a South Asia audience, but uh, these are a couple of pictures from Ahmedabad. And a lot has been written about how historically um, caste groups would often form their own neighborhoods. Um, and so this you can see here is sort of like a walled in little neighborhood around a, a central square. Um, and actually they often even have these fortified gates that could be closed to wall off this neighborhood from any sort of outside threats. And so historically, we think um, while there isn't great quantitative evidence, there were very high levels of caste segregation with these groups living in very different places and providing uh, local goods for themselves. And one of the primary local goods was actual physical protection. One last piece of, of context here is uh, a different paper that uh, Paul, my co-author in this paper, and uh, another Charlie Rafkin, who's a terrific PhD student at MIT. We have this work on intergenerational mobility in India, um, where we develop some new methods for studying mobility across time and groups by, um, by community, or that, I guess that's the groups, um, but basically using educational data because the sorts of rich tax data that's available in the United States and in Denmark and other rich countries isn't available in a place like India. And what we basically find, uh, there's a lot going on in that paper, but uh, the most relevant finding for here is that over the last 40 years or so, despite the massive economic and political changes that India has undergone, um, intergenerational mobility has stayed overall flat. Your chance of being born to a poor family and rising up through the distribution um, is the same as it ever was, even though the rising tide is lifting all boats. Um, they're staying in roughly the same order, but that actually that overall result is covering up a lot of heterogeneity. And what we're finding is that actually scheduled castes have closed about half of the mobility gap with upper castes, whereas Muslims have actually fallen further behind. So the educational gaps for poor children born to, born to poor parents now are bigger between, say, upper castes and Muslims than they were um, several decades ago. And so it's in this context of Muslims falling behind that we were particularly, while scheduled castes are closing the gap, um, that we were particularly interested in studying um, segregation and access to public goods. Okay, I've mentioned data requirements a couple times now. Um, basically, segregation is a hard thing to study. Um, you need really high spatial resolution data. You need to know exactly what neighborhoods people live in. Um, you need to know what communities they belong to. If I just know where everybody lives, but I don't know who's Muslim and who's scheduled caste and who's other, 
I'm not going to be able to study this question. Um, we really, as I said, wanted to connect the, the settlement patterns to access to public goods and to actual economic outcomes for those households. And so we're going to need rich data that allow us to characterize the economic outcomes and the public goods. So we're going to do all of this by combining data from a few different sources. Um, the primary ones are the socioeconomic and caste census and this economic census. Um, the first was conducted in 2012 mostly. It covers absolutely every household and individual in India. And critically for our purposes, it has uh, a geographic identifier of an enumeration block, which is a neighborhood of about 100 to 125 households. That's about 500 to 700 uh, individuals on average. Um, and we don't know exactly where these neighborhoods are within cities, but we know that they're separate neighborhoods. We know that this enumeration block is 100 households living together. And that's what we're going to be using for the purposes of this, uh, this study. We're going to have demographics. We're going to know whether someone's scheduled caste. We're going to categorize based on names, whether a household is Muslim. Um, and we have a wide range of different assets and other variables describing the socioeconomic status of the household, um, which we're going to combine using what's called small area estimation. And the idea of small area estimation is to take some other survey um, and regress consumption on a bunch of variables to get the coefficients on how much each of those variables sort of predict of how well off the household is. So having a four wheel vehicle predicts that I'm 18,000 rupees per month richer than if I have a two wheel vehicle, which predicts that I'm 10,000 rupees per month richer than if I have just a bicycle. And we take all of those different assets and we put them together into a singular measure of um, our approximate uh, consumption per capita. So that's going to be all about who, how well off are you and what community you belong to and what neighborhood you live in. Um, then from the economic census, which is a complete enumeration of all non-farm economic establishments in the country, uh, we're going to be able to get public and private facilities by health and education. And so actually within education, we'll know the difference between primary schools and secondary schools. So we can break out that analysis a little bit there. But what's essential for us here is A, we know what neighborhoods they're in so that we can match them to all these households. And B, we know whether they're private or public. And we're going to be focusing on is the public sector providing more or fewer of these uh, assets to uh, different types of neighborhoods. Then we're also going to have uh, some town and village level data from the population census. And for the small amount of comparison that we do to the United States, we're going to use the Diversities and Disparities Survey as well as the ACS, the American Community Survey. I can't give a talk without giving a little bit of a plug for uh, the open data work that we're doing. And in fact, this whole project is built on uh, this data platform that we've made publicly available uh, that Devesh mentioned briefly. So this is called the SHRUG, the Socioeconomic High Resolution Rural Urban Geographic uh, Panel or Data Platform for India. Um, Paul and I have been working together for uh, about a decade now since our PhDs on using really high spatial resolution data in India to try to understand the drivers of growth, structural transformation, and poverty alleviation at the local level. Um, and India is just a wonderful place to be studying these issues, both because there's so much data and because it's at a high, it's at least sometimes available at a high spatial resolution, um, which gives you 600,000 villages and, and 8,000 towns. Uh, to study as well as 4,000 assembly constituencies and so on. And so what we've done here is combined a huge amount of data from all of these different sources at this very local level um, and made it available from 1990 to the present. Um, so that's all posted on our website, devdatalab.org slash shrug. Um, please do check it out, get in touch. Uh, one of the things that we're encouraging is people to use, but then contribute back to the platform so that others can make use of the data that, that you've put together. And so uh, please do get in touch if there's, there's some uh, way that you'd like to participate or contribute. But we have everything from demographics to estimates of, of income to agricultural productivity by season, uh, night lights, uh, firms, political outcomes, and, and other administrative data from programs like the Rural Roads Program in India. Okay, as I mentioned, um, we need to classify uh, which households are Muslim. We actually know from the data who's scheduled caste, um, but we don't know religion. And so we do have the names in this socioeconomic caste census for every household. We just don't know their religion. They didn't release that data. Um, but for Muslims in India, their names are very, very strong predictors of their actual religion. 
And so we need to use a machine learning model, in this case, an LSTM model to classify names as Muslim. Um, and so we, what we need is training data that is a large set of names that have religious identifiers or what's called labels in, in machine learning speak, um, and then allows us to use that training data to predict our larger data set, which of these households are Muslim and which ones are not. And we basically uh, do a bunch of tests to see how accurate we were. And we think we have over 95% accuracy in predicting uh, households' religious status. And one of the things we do, which you can see on this figure at the bottom, is we look at our predicted Muslim share from the socioeconomic caste census compared to what the population census reports at these higher levels of aggregation and find that they're uh, super tightly related. Okay, um, we're mostly gonna be focusing on neighborhoods, but when we do look at segregation measures, um, we use an index of dissimilarity, uh, which basically says how unevenly distributed across space are members of these groups. So um, if the a city is 10% Muslim, um, zero dissimilarity says that every single neighborhood within that city is 10% Muslim and total dissimilarity or dissimilarity measure of one says that every neighborhood is either 100% Muslim or has no Muslims in it at all. Um, I'm just going to skip this because I'm sure we're going to be running out of time. Um, how do we define access to public goods? Um, as I've already argued these are these goods are not truly public but are available to people in local areas so it's very important whether you actually have them in your neighborhood or not. Um, we're going to measure from the economic census we'll know primary schools and secondary schools these have different industrial codes in the economic census. And then we're just going to lump all government health facilities together. So inpatient, outpatient, and other. Most, most are just outpatient, um, but we'll just lump it all together and say, is there a health facility in your neighborhood? Or how much of a health facility do you have in your neighborhood using the log of employment in these, uh, in these facilities? So here you have the basic summary statistics. Um, look on the left-hand side. That's going to be the enumeration block. That's the sort of most local neighborhood we have. So on average, these have about 500 population. Um, as you can see, scheduled castes live um, about three to two in rural areas, whereas the relationship is kind of flipped for Muslims. Muslims are slightly more urban. Um, and so your average rural block uh, ha has about 17% scheduled caste population. Your average urban block has about 12% scheduled caste population, and that's kind of flipped uh, for Muslims. They're in more urban areas. Our basic way of testing for whether public goods are being uh, unevenly distributed is to regress uh, an outcome, which is measuring, say, public goods, uh, so the, say the presence of a health facility on the share of your neighborhood that is scheduled caste, the share of the neighborhood that's Muslim. We're going to have a fixed effect for the city. So we're only comparing neighborhoods within a particular city or within a particular rural subdistrict. And then we'll just control for the population of the neighborhood, just because larger neighborhoods are more likely to have uh, any of these things. So let's look at rural segregation first. There's this huge, mostly qualitative literature on how segregated rural India is by caste and by religion, both across villages, but even within villages. Um, you go to an average uh, village in, in North India and you often see different neighborhoods named for the different uh, caste groups that are there. Um, so how segregated overall is, is rural India and, and how much does this affect public goods and living standards? Um, and we're going to establish a few basic facts. There's a, there's a high degree of segregation. Um, there are dis big disparities in public goods access um, for neighborhoods that have more marginalized groups, particularly for Muslims. Um, and and uh, living standards are lowest in the areas that have the most marginalized groups. So first of all, here's the distribution of dissimilarity of segregation across uh, rural areas. Um, I recognize this is a bit hard to interpret, but one thing I wanted to show here is that we have two different ways of grouping, of like basically forming neighborhoods. And we can form neighborhoods um, as being at least 200 population, or we try to lump them together and say, group a whole bunch of neighborhoods together into a larger neighborhood. Um, and go up to about 4,000 population. And what you can see here is that the dissimilarity distribution shifts to the left as the neighborhoods get bigger. So basically, segregation is a highly local phenomenon. We can see already that, that segregation measures are highest when we're looking at the smallest units here. Um, what you can see here is, and this is after taking out 
uh, the variation due to, to subdistricts. Um, we can see here is how the provision of primary schools, so this is just the probability that a neighborhood has a primary school, uh, varies with the share of the population in each of these two groups. And what you can see is there's actually not too much of a relationship for scheduled castes, but for Muslims, there's a very strong downward relationship where when a village goes from having no Muslims, or sorry, when a neighborhood goes from having no Muslims to having, say, 60% Muslims, um, the probability that it has uh, a primary school is, is dropping by like 20%. And this is true across a range of facilities. Here's a different way of seeing that same thing from that regression that I showed you. So these are the coefficients. So if the coefficients are on the red dotted line, it means that neighborhoods that have a lot of these groups or, or not many of these groups aren't different in the provision of these public goods. But if these values are very negative, as you can see, they are, for example, the, the top red one, which is employment in primary schools, um, is showing that the areas that have a lot of Muslims have much lower provision of these government primary schools. So basically focusing on the blue dots, you, you can see that in rural areas, um, you have fewer primary schools in the neighborhoods that are more scheduled cast, you have fewer secondary schools, but the differences between neighborhoods that have a lot of scheduled cast and those that don't aren't that great. Whereas the red dots being much, much below the blue dots is showing that actually the areas that have a lot of Muslims just have much lower provision of, of these public goods. And if I go to the table, what you can see here, so focus on column three here, what you can see here is that the coefficient on Muslim share is negative 0.019 on secondary schools, but the mean dependent variable is 0 0.066. So 6.6% 6 .6 of neighborhoods have a secondary school at all, because not every single neighborhood is going to have a secondary school. But when you go from no Muslims to all Muslims, the likelihood that a neighborhood has a public school drops by almost a third. So these are huge differences in your likelihood of, of getting one of these public goods. And a kind of similar thing is happening, though less severe, for, uh, for example, for health facilities. Let me go back. OK. Um, what you can see, uh, this is doing a similar exercise, but putting consumption on the left-hand side rather than the provision of these public goods. Um, and what you can see here, because we have consumption for each of these different groups, we can see how does consumption, how does poverty change um, as neighborhoods get more and more uh, people from these different groups. And what you can see here is that basically Muslims in scheduled castes are much poorer in neighborhoods that have a lot of Muslim or scheduled castes, but actually in those rural areas that have a lot of Muslims in scheduled castes, the, the, the people in the other groups are actually less poor. So there seems to be a kind of penalty for, for being in these enclaves for the marginalized groups, but not for the other groups. This is actually gonna be different in urban areas. Okay, let's go to let's go to urban areas. Um, so our takeaway from from rural areas is that there are these huge inequalities in the provision of these public goods, um, as well as in consumption, um, depending on how many people live of, of these marginalized groups live in these areas. Um, do we see these patterns repeating themselves in urban areas? And the answer is yes. Um, urban areas are are as segregated, um, and we are going to find very large inequalities in public goods provision and in living standards across neighborhoods. So here on the left-hand side in the kind of smaller boxes, you see the distributions that we saw already. Um, on the top row is for these smaller neighborhoods of about uh, 500 population on average. Um, on the bottom row is these larger groupings of neighborhoods uh, where we group up to about 4,000 population. And what you can see here is that uh, urban neighborhoods are as segregated as their rural counterparts. Um, and the same relationship holds that scheduled castes tend to be more segregated than Muslims. Um, in the bottom right panel, we actually put for comparison the distribution of segregation in the US for US Blacks. That's the green line um, that appears in the bottom right hand panel that isn't in the other ones. And what you can see is that US Blacks are about as segregated as scheduled castes in India, um, but actually Muslims are less segregated than either of these, these two groups. So here we're going to show you the same bin scatter, which is basically charting out the relationship between neighborhood share and likelihood of having these public goods. Um, for scheduled castes, you can see that there is a drop 
when the, the neighborhoods are have a very high percentage of scheduled castes, like over 40%, um, you can see that there's lower provision of here, we're looking at secondary schools, but you can see throughout the distribution for Muslims, just for every 10% uh, increase or 10 percentage point increase in the share of the neighborhood that's Muslim, we're finding about um, two tenths of a percentage point drop in the likelihood of having a secondary school. And as I pointed out earlier, these are really big effects because there aren't that many secondary schools, your probability overall in an urban area of having a secondary school is only about 2%. Um, so basically going from no Muslims to 80% Muslims is kind of cutting in half your likelihood of actually having a secondary school in your neighborhood. So we, we looked at these coefficient plots before. The left-hand side is exactly what I showed you earlier for rural areas. The right-hand side is for urban areas. Um, and what you can see here is that actually urban areas uh, with a lot of scheduled castes are actually more likely to have a primary school, but less likely to have secondary schools and health facilities. Whereas across the board, primary schools, secondary schools, and health facilities, um, the more Muslim a neighborhood is, the, the less likely it is to have any of these, these government provided public goods. Um, you can also see this in consumption. So we didn't look at this before, but on the right-hand side, you can see how consumption varies with the share of the population that's scheduled cast. Um, and it's sort of reflecting what I, what I described to you earlier, which is that basically the more scheduled cast there are in a neighborhood, the more um, the poorer are both scheduled caste and Muslims, but not so much of a, of a difference or if anything, a positive slope for other groups. In urban areas, this is not the case. And we think this is probably because there's more sorting into neighborhoods in urban areas. It's hard to move neighborhoods in rural areas. It's hard to move across villages. It's even hard to move within villages, but in urban areas, people move, people decide what neighborhoods to live in. Um, and then basically poor scheduled caste Muslims and uh, people from other communities are sorting into these uh, more marginalized group areas. The same basic patterns hold if we look over the range of, of Muslim share rather than of scheduled caste share. Um, and this is consistent again with this sorting. Um, this is looking at it with these coefficient plots, even the other groups. Remember the other groups were actually richer in the uh, majority marginalized group areas uh, in rural areas, in urban areas, everyone is poorer in these areas uh, that have a lot of scheduled castes and Muslims. How persistent, we, we then wanna look over time and see whether these patterns of public goods provision are changing over time. Um, and we're only gonna be able to do this for villages because villages are the only stable unit that we can follow across a longer time period. So we're gonna look from 1991, 2001, and 2011. These are three rounds of the census where we can observe at the village level the share of the population and, and public goods. But as I said, we had to classify Muslims from the socioeconomic caste census. That only exists in 2012. The census doesn't release data on religion at the local level. Um, so the first thing we want to do is say, are these population shares pretty consistent? Are we pretty confident that when we see that a village is very Muslim in 2012, that it actually was very Muslim in 2001 and 1991? Um, we can't test that because we don't see Muslims in these earlier rounds. Um, so, but we do see scheduled castes in each of these three rounds. And so we can say, are these shares pretty consistent? And the answer is, is absolutely. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of demographic change in the in sort of caste, and therefore we infer in religion uh, across this, this 20 year period from 1991 to 2011. So this figure gives us some confidence that we can just sort of take the values that we observe more recently in 2012 and use them to see what these villages looked like back in 2011, 2001, and 1991. And so that's what we do here. Um, we're gonna have from the population census, uh, whether the village had a primary school, whether the village had a secondary school and whether the village had a health facility. And we see some really, really interesting patterns, which is villages that uh, were, had more scheduled castes were less likely to have a primary school in 1991, but actually by 2001 and then 2011, we're actually more likely to have primary schools. So there's been a really big push to expand education to scheduled castes, and it looks like schools actually have been targeted into these areas that have more scheduled castes. 
Whereas basically we see for Muslims that in 1991, very Muslim villages were much less likely to have a primary school. That improved slightly by 2001 and actually worsened slightly by 2011. But we don't see a whole lot of change over this, this 20 year period. Basically more Muslim villages are, have way fewer government primary schools and this has been staying pretty constant. Actually, the relationship is worsening for secondary schools and going in different directions um, in a way that's actually some consistent with our mobility results. So here, what you can see is that secondary schools and India has built a lot of secondary schools from 1991 to 2011 actually are getting less unevenly distributed when it comes to schedule castes. So it seems like more schedule caste villages still have a disadvantage. There's still fewer secondary schools being provided to them by the government, but that gap is smaller than it used to be. But if you look at Muslims, it's actually going in the, it's worsening. So secondary schools started out disproportionately distributed towards less Muslim areas. Um, and the, the newer construction of secondary schools is only actually worsening those gaps. I think it's worth pointing out here um, that actually all of this includes state fixed effects. So this is not about comparing North India to South India. Some areas have more Muslims than others. This is really about across villages that are near to each other. The, Muslim, the, the villages that have more Muslims get fewer sec had fewer secondary schools back in 1991, and the distribution of new secondary schools, the construction of new secondary schools is worsening those, those inequalities. And we basically see similar things for both scheduled castes and Muslims with health facilities. That basically health facilities started out uh, distributed away from Muslim and scheduled caste villages, and that those gaps are only growing as more health facilities get built between 1991 and 2011. Okay, so we most of this paper is focusing on what's happening at the neighborhood level, but I started out talking about segregation um, and I, I, I wanna kind of close talking about segregation as well. Um, so we think we've learned a lot about inequalities by looking at these neighborhood levels. Um, we wanna zoom out and, and think about what's happening to the, the aggregate effect of, of segregation. Um, there's, there's a very wide literature on segregation, particularly in the US, as I said, comparing how segregated cities are to all sorts of outcomes for different groups. Um, it's a very, very difficult literature to get much of a handle on causality because basically there are all sorts of forces, um, cultural forces, political forces, and so on that are driving segregation, but might also be driving inequalities that observe directly. Um, but we still wanna kind of understand as a starting point, what exactly is the relationship between segregation and various economic outcomes. So here we're gonna run a, a similar regression to before, but this is gonna be at the city level because segregation is a city level or a sub-district level phenomenon, not a neighborhood level phenomenon. And remember, it's basically saying how unevenly are people distributed across neighborhoods within a larger unit, in this case, a city or a sub-district. And so we're gonna say, okay, within states are the cities that are more dissimilar, that are more segregated, either along scheduled caste lines or along Muslim lines, are they, do they see worse economic outcomes? Uh, first of all, we can show you a map of segregation. Notice that there are a bunch of holes in the map. That's where we're missing some data. Um, we have data for almost every state in India, but we don't necessarily have it for every district within each of these states. Um, one of the things that struck me about these maps, so this is scheduled caste segregation on the left in rural India and on the right in urban India. Um, and actually I was struck by the lack of clear patterns, for example, between North and South that you often see in many other maps that we, you see in poverty, that you see in industrialization, that you see uh, in gender relations or inequalities um, and that you see in mobility. Um, here you see that the very high levels of segregation in rural India, for example, in Western India, like in Gujarat and Maharashtra have very, very high levels. Um, the South isn't noticeably better. Um, actually, segregation seems pretty low in some very poor parts of the, of the Northern Gangetic Plain. Um, so basically, like I show these maps to show that actually there's, there's sort of less of a really clear pattern than, than I think many people expect. Uh, likewise for, for Muslims, um, actually, we see really high rates of Muslim segregation in Eastern India, like in Odisha and, and Bihar. Um, not necessarily shocking, but, um, you know, actually lower levels of Muslim segregation in places in the South, like Tamil Nadu, in particularly in the urban areas that you can see on the bottom right. Um, but again, not like super clear patterns that stand out in the way uh, a lot of other outcomes do when you look at maps of India. <clears throat> 
We do find that uh, younger cities are less segregated. So here on the x-axis, we're plotting the age of the city based on the year that the city first appears as an urban space in the town directories in India, so in the census. So basically, if a city has a birth year of 2000, which is the furthest to the right, that means that it only kind of converted from a rural to an urban area, only gained population essentially above 5,000. It's a little more complicated than that, but essentially think of this as crossing the 5,000 population threshold. Um, very recently in 2000, um, you know, in 1900, it means that it's been an urban space for, for 100, 120 years. And what you can see here is that the younger cities are less segregated than the older cities. And we're controlling for city population here. So this is not just about large versus small cities. This is really saying that the, whatever the forces are that are driving segregation they seem to be a little bit less strong, both for scheduled caste segregation and for Muslim segregation in, uh, in these younger cities. Um, we interpret this as suggesting, A, that these forces are changing over time and maybe getting a little uh, less strong, but also that there's a lot of persistence because the older cities, even if they were, um, even if the cultural forces or political forces that were driving segregation were very strong back then, they could have remade themselves over the last hundred years. People move around, we know that, but we also know that there's a lot of stickiness in where people actually live and people tend to stay in the same neighborhoods across generations. So somewhat encouraging sign that the younger cities are less segregated, but at the same time, if you look at the size of these slopes relative to the level of these lines, you can see that, you know, Indian cities are that are founded sometime in the next, you know, over a thousand years might be uh, relatively unsegregated, but this is going to be a very long and slow process. We do find, interestingly, that bigger cities are more segregated. So this is controlling for the age of the city. This is controlling for the state. Um, and we do find that the larger the city, particularly when it comes to Muslim segregation, um, the, the very largest cities are more segregated than the smaller cities. Interestingly, we don't find much of a pattern in overall public good provision against segregation. So if we're looking at the total number of schools in the city, or if we're looking at the total employment in schools, government schools in the city, we don't find, this is within states, that the more uh, segregated cities are just building a lot fewer schools. So this isn't about overall school construction. It's about exactly where the schools are going. And that's what we see at the neighborhood level. So we see at the neighborhood level that the more Muslim areas have fewer schools. But overall in the cities that, that are very segregated, that where Muslims are very concentrated in different areas, they're not building fewer schools. It's just they're very unevenly distributing them across space. We do find, however, that everybody is poorer in the cities that are more segregated. So this is rural. The next one is urban. Um, so first of all, the big gap between the, the brown dots and the, the red and the blue is just the usual fact that people from other groups are richer than these scheduled castes or Muslims. Um, those are just the big inequalities across groups that we observe. But we do find that the more segregated a city is, the poorer it is. Now, what's totally unclear here is, is segregation in poverty? Is it that places that have high levels of segregation are losing out on all sorts of economic opportunities because people are not mixing with each other, people are not don't trust each other, um, aren't taking advantage of, of opportunities for collaboration and trade? Um, or is it that um, that, it, that the causality is going in the other direction and actually poverty is in some way driving segregation? The challenge in this paper is really that we have basically this one cross section of data, right? We have this one cross section of where people live in, 19, in 2012 and where all the public goods are in 2013. And we're trying to learn as much as we possibly can from this very high spatial resolution, but, uh, but cross sectional data. And so we can say that these, these relationships are very strong, but we're gonna to have to leave for future work probably by other groups who can put together, other research teams who can probably put together better data to say, is, it, is segregation driving poverty or is poverty driving segregation? Uh, finally, let me just close by saying, you know, we open this, this paper by asking about the relationship between rural and urban segregation. I'm showing you that urban areas are as segregated as rural areas. Um, this is partly because uh, the high seg highly segregated rural areas, those very same districts are highly segregated in the urban areas as well. 
And we take this to probably suggest that there's a very important cultural component to uh, segregation and that whatever the cultural forces are that are driving rural segregation are being reproduced in the nearby urban areas, which are largely, you know, the population in those rural areas are largely the same people who live in the nearby rural areas. And so this is true for both scheduled castes and for Muslims that the urban areas, the segregation in urban area is very, very strongly predicted by segregation in the villages just nearby. We also show that segregation is a very highly local phenomenon. I mentioned this earlier, but here's a nice way of showing it, which is to say we can group, we, we start out with these neighborhoods which only have about a hundred households. We can group them into larger and larger units by combining them with nearby neighborhoods. So we start out with the smallest possible neighborhood size, then we combine neighborhoods with the one neighborhood next to them, and we combine neighborhoods with the two neighborhoods next to them and so on to get larger and larger aggregations and see what happens to our segregation measures. And what we basically find um, is that segregation is decreasing in the size of this unit. So it is really highly local. If you, if you look at, look on the right-hand panel, which is in urban areas, um, for reference point, you can see US blacks using the ACS, uh, census blocks in the U.S. have about a population of 4,000. Um, so here we're comparing them at groupings of 4,000. Scheduled castes are more segregated than U.S. Blacks. Muslims are less segregated than U.S. Blacks. What we can see here by following the blue line is that the segregation measure basically gets cut in half when you go from neighborhoods that have population of about 100 or, or 500, let's say, to populations of about 7,000. So as you zoom out, we can really see that, that segregation is decreasing. It is a highly local phenomenon, neighborhood by neighborhood. Okay, what are we doing in next steps with this paper? Uh, well, um, one question we're asking is, is private provision compensating for inequalities in public amenities? We've shown you that there are these huge inequalities in public amenities, that neighborhoods that have particularly more Muslims are much less likely to uh, get government schools and health facilities. We have some preliminary results right now that suggest that Muslim neighborhoods, particularly richer Muslim neighborhoods, are making up for the lack of public amenities by providing their own schools and health centers. Um, and it's really that the poorest areas, particularly the poorest Muslim areas, are the ones that look like they are getting major penalties and the government is not providing these goods, but then are too poor to provide their own goods for these things. Um, the second thing we're going to look at in the future, though probably not in this paper, is spatial mismatch. So there's a very large literature in urban economics, again, mostly in rich countries where the data is a lot better, um, looking at the mismatch between where people live and where the jobs are. And finding in particular, for example, that like African Americans often live in neighborhoods that are very far away from jobs and that that has big consequences for the jobs they get and the wages that they earn. Um, we are in the process of geocoding neighborhoods for some of India's biggest cities and really hope to be able to characterize how far people live from the job centers in each of these cities. Um, and then we, we've I told you a little bit about neighborhood size already. Um, so let me just wrap up and then I would really love to, to have a conversation around these issues. Um, so we argue that segregation is really greatly understudied in, in lower income countries. Um, we think this is largely due to a lack of data, um, that it's just Studying segregation requires having really high spatial resolution data and knowing exactly where people live, who they are, who else is living around them, and so on. Um, rural India has been understood to be segregated for centuries, and we want to know, are these inequalities being replicated in India's booming cities? Um, to scholars of, of India's cities, maybe it's not surprising, but we think it's pretty valuable to put some numbers on this. Um, we're, established, we're showing, yes, rural India is, is super segregated, um, and yes, urban India does seem to uh, be reproducing these, these uh, inequalities. And in some ways, it's even worsening some of these patterns. Um, segregation is slightly higher by some measures in, in these urban areas. Um, and some of these inequalities in access to public goods are, are even worse. Um, interestingly, while scheduled castes, there's more segregation by caste, um, there's actually less of a penalty for being in a highly scheduled caste area. Um, it's the really highly Muslim areas that are really, really missing out on the public goods that the government is providing. And in future papers, we hope that either we or other research teams can make progress in understanding uh, some of both the potential causes of segregation as well as the consequences of segregation.
Um, and so these include the rise of a Hindu nationalist uh, political party that with a lot of antipathy towards uh, Muslims, um, the role of communal violence. Um, India is characterized by high levels of both inter-caste and inter-religious violence. And so the extent to which that violence is both a cause and effect of uh, high levels of segregation is, is an open question. There's a lot of qualitative work and a little bit of quantitative work studying discrimination in housing markets, but you hear about it a ton, that there's just a lot of discrimination uh, where landlords don't want to rent to people of different religions or castes. Um, so understanding how that drives segregation and the consequences that has uh, for the economic outcomes for these communities. Um, and then finally, something I'm extremely excited about is we're in the process of putting together um, cultural data on the norms of 5,000 uh, different castes and, and other sorts of community groups, caste, tribes, religious groups across all of India from this anthropological survey of India. And we both have very detailed data from about 1990, but also from the old British anthropological surveys done around 1900. Um, and we want to understand the extent to which um, the norms of social groups against eating with other groups, against mixing with other groups, against marrying other groups may be playing a very important role um, in, in driving spatial segregation and, and then the economic outcomes associated with it. So let me stop there and say thank you so much for your attention. Um, I'm, I, it's a little weird for me to just talk for an hour without questions. So I, I do hope that, that people are paying some attention. I'm sure you were. And uh, I really look forward to your comments. Thanks, Sam. Uh, uh, so, so maybe I'll just begin and then I'll sort of uh, read out the, the, the you know, questions. So I was wondering if some of your data is now a bit dated in the following sense. I was particularly struck by your data on schools and I've been following four public goods, uh, schools, electrification, toilets and pipe water. And one of the things you might want to take advantage of is the Right to Education Act. And if you know, uh, that is a statute, you know, it's a statutory provision. And what the act uh, sort of said was that, that uh, schools have to be within a one kilometer radius, right? For primary schools and three kilometers for middle school. Uh, but it did not say anything about secondary schools. So what that, means is that the degree of wave of sort of provision or bias is probably going to be much greater in secondary schools and your data sort of seems to be showing that than for primary schools but by the time you are you are sort of measuring to 2012 13 this act is being rolled out it's not fully rolled out it's rolled out more in some states but by now it's basically being rolled out and you get uh, somewhat of a hint of that if you follow NFHS. That's not giving you by neighborhood, but it is giving you by high, by high, it is giving you a sense of access by households. And you see a huge increase in access by households of households, including Muslims from NFHS one to the one that uh, just came out NFHS, you know, 1890. So, one is that when you have your data, it's sort of almost in the middle of this, of this rollout because of the implementation. And I think you might be able to exploit the Right to Education Act, both comparing it to health, but also between primary and secondary schools. Uh, the other sort of electrification, because now, uh, you know, all villages are electrified. So, it would be interesting if it's now it's more about how much power you get and whether there is electrification within households in villages. Uh, the third is the whole program on toilets and you, and you know that well, uh, whether you can use some of that as well. And the last, because it's just being rolled out, it's supposed to be 100% access, which is pipe water. Uh, and if you can exploit that as well, I think it'll add like to the richness of your, of your work. 
uh, suggest a thought. I'll just, uh, do you want to sort of, uh, you need me to read out some of the questions or? Yeah, let me give a quick, while, while this is fresh, let me give some quick thoughts on that and then let's yeah. move on to, to the other questions. So thanks so much, Darish. This is, yeah, th th these are great suggestions. Um, one of the challenges just um, from a research standpoint is that we've really wanted to focus on these local neighborhoods, particularly because that gives us information within cities and basically the only within there are some there's some data on like wards within cities but wards within cities are generally absolutely gigantic um if we, we i did show you some results by villages for example that those results going back in time and showing how like these inequalities have evolved over over the last few censuses um if we decide to stick with villages there's obviously a lot more that we can do because we do have more data on electrification and and some of these other variables for these staple village units over over these three censuses though we're still running into the problem that you raised that like the last census was conducted in 2011 it's probably going to be many years before we have data from the 2021 census um and so we certainly want to get out at least this draft before then um one thing we can do we did just put together a large amount of new data um the india's rural roads program um keeps characterizing villages to be able to prioritize where the next rounds of rural roads should go. And so actually in 2020, they collected a lot of data on uh, amenities at the habitation level, which can be aggregated up to villages. And so we just put that together. So we can kind of essentially add a decade to our analysis. And that adds a lot because uh, we were thinking of this for, for political factors, because we'll be able to look over the last decade, which we think may have been really consequential from the standpoint uh, of uh, political power at the local level. Um, but also, as you say, the RTE rolled out, there's just been a very large prioritization of building out the sort of infrastructure of the state in these areas. Um, nicely, actually electrification, um, once upon a time, the census only collected uh, information on whether a village was electrified or not. Now it actually has the hours of electricity that villages right. get electricity. I don't know how much to trust that, Right. But there is a lot of variation, and so we, we can't actually look at that. But uh, yeah, totally agree. If we move in a in a village direction, and and I think we probably should have a big section on villages, we will absolutely look at all of these uh, these other public goods. Uh, great. So, so I'll just sort of read out the the first question is from Sneha Mahapatra, and she thanks you for your great uh, for your deeply informative and insightful talk. I have a question related to the definition of the term segregation. Is it synonymous as being restricted to a homogenous neighborhood because of being ostracized and therefore being forced to become a conglomerate based on religion or caste? And does that, uh, uh, and is, is that a, does that a parameter matter in your study? Does your study also examine whether religious and caste-based segregation also influence gender-based segregation uh, uh, as becoming factors causing forced migration? Okay, great. Um, so we don't look at gender segregation. There probably are variation. There is variation in like uh, in the share of. Uh, the population that's male or female in these neighborhoods, but generally speaking, a lot less than across other groups, because usually households have both men and women. Um, though certainly in some areas, there are a lot of male mig more male migrants. The work by Chinmay Tumbe and others really show how, how India's cities are often uh, quite male skewed. Um, but in, in terms of the definition of segregation, so I'll refer back to what I was saying at the beginning of this presentation. Um, Researchers of segregation kind of think that segregation can come about from at least three different major forces. So the first is that um, marginalized groups can self-segregate, and you saw you often saw this with with ethnic enclaves. You know, um, my grandparents grew up in neighborhoods in New York that were almost entirely Jewish because they valued being around other Jews, either for food or for religious reasons or for protection or whatever. Um, so there's some amount of self-segregation because groups provide their own kind yeah, of goods to each other. These are little Italy's and so on. Exactly, we have little Italy's, we have Chinatowns. Um, we should we should show some humility in the interpretation here because it's also possible that these groups are being collectively excluded from other neighborhoods. There may be a lot of people living in Chinatowns that wanna live in some other neighborhood of the, the city, but people refuse to rent to them 
And so that's the sort of what's referred to in the literature as collective exclusion, that the dominant group is, is collectively excluding the, the marginalized group. Um, and the third is that um, there might not be collective exclusion, but it might be that the marginalized group ends up basically fleeing, this is what we often call white flight in the US, fleeing neighborhoods when they when they when the population gets to be too high of some other group. So African-Americans move into a neighborhood and after a certain point, the white people start leaving. And so actually the segregation that we observe is some combination of African-Americans moving to be around each other, but also of, of other groups moving away from them. And when we started on this work, we were really hoping that we would be able to say more than we actually can about these different forces in India. The fact is that when you're looking in a single cross section, we think we're, we're you know, bringing a lot of new facts to light because generally people have not had these kind of data before. Um, we've been able to ask these questions, but what you really want to study and differentiate between these different factors is to have data over time that allow you to see whether you know, caste Hindus are fleeing neighborhoods when they get above a certain amount of scheduled caste. We can't see that in the cross section or whether violence that erupts in certain Indian cities against Muslims at a certain time then leads to self-segregation and people moving away into their own neighborhoods. Um, we just, we can't differentiate between these three in, in the cross section, though we really, really hope that people will be able to do more in the future. And I think part of what this calls for is the government in particular to release a whole lot more data um, at a much higher spatial resolution than, than has ever been released before so that people can study these issues. Um, uh, just uh, so something I forgot to ask you. One thing I would have thought you guys would do more since you're economists is actually the economic structure of the city and how that might matter. And to use the NOC, uh, you know, the National Occupational Classification the data. Because we know that in the past, you know, castes and occupations were linked. We know that certain social groups, irrespective of that, for a variety of, of reasons, you know, if you look at the history of Chicago, you know, Lithuanians all went into, Lithuanian immigrants went into certain sectors, and then their cousins came, they also got jobs and so on. So I was wondering if you could exploit the NOC to see the occupational structures, how concentrated or diverse they are, and whether that might also be playing a role and whether you had thought of that as well. Because I didn't get a sense from your thing whether the city's economic structure mattered in how residential segregations are evolved. Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. And the, the economic structure has multiple components to it. It has, you know, one is what kind of jobs are there in this city? The second is how spatially concentrated are those jobs across right. space? You know, you can think about how good is the transportation network? And like, uh, one of the things I would love to study at some point is like how the Delhi Metro really changed, for example, the, the economic structure of the city and where people ended up living and where the right. jobs were. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, we're thinking of writing this whole additional paper on spatial mismatch between where the jobs are according to the economic census and where the occupations are, where people are according to the to the to their red place of residence from the socioeconomic and caste census. And um, so I think that that's the right place for us to be investigating uh, these sort of questions of the economic structure of the city. We we kind of I've had to make some judgment calls about what goes into the first paper and what goes into the future papers and. Right. Um, and one okay. of the things that's made that process a little bit easier has been not knowing exactly where all of these neighborhoods are within cities. And so not really being able to ask that spatial mismatch question yet, but we're investing in it. It, it turns out that Google Maps is still not good enough in India to right. really, really easily code up all of the neighborhoods that we have. Um, and so it's taking a lot of manual work. And, and so it's a, it's a slow sort of bootstrapped process whenever we find a, a PhD student or other people who wanna work with us on this. Uh, Cheap labor question, always always drives progress. Yes, uh, from Joy King, but I think you've answered it. Thank you so much for this informative uh, presentation. I was wondering if in future studies you will expand the good studies such as access to electricity, water, transportation, etc. I think you've just answered that. Yeah. So basically, you know, I, let me maybe I didn't make this clear enough at the beginning of the talk. Um, we really stick to these two public goods, uh, which are 
like educational facilities and health facilities because we can observe them in the economic census. The economic census actually records that this structure is a school that is provided by the government and we know exactly where it is. Obviously, um, I, you know, I share the interests of a lot of people in this group, including Devish and, and others, in like a lot of these other public goods. And, and ideally, we'd be able to see all of them. We can see all of them at the village level, at least. Um, but one of the things we're trying to say is that even within villages, there are these big disparities. Within cities, there are these big disparities, and we want to characterize those. But absolutely, um, one of the things that we're struggling with in the data is just that um, some of the data in the census don't make entirely clear whether provision is public or private. Um, and, and a lot of these goods, like take piped water, um, you know, some of that is about the government providing kind of basic water and some sort of, of supply, but then part of this is about some households investing in building connections to the piped water system and others not. And what we don't want to conflate here, we all know that schedule casts are poorer than the rest of the population. We all know that Muslims are poorer than the rest of the population. So we, we really wanted to try to focus on the kinds of government provided goods that are supposed to be going to everybody, but we all know are not going equally to everybody and characterizing those inequalities. So we really have tried to focus on, on goods where we basically know exactly where they are and that the government is supposed to be providing equally rather than some of these goods like pipe water that kind of conflate a little bit of, of public and private provision. Uh, so, uh, you know, Sneha has one more question for you. Do you sure. feel over time technological advances have led to better capacity? And to what extent have been able to facilitate this sort of that sort of comprehensive research that you're doing? What, according to you, is the future of the field of data-driven research overcoming shortcomings in data collection for studying segregation? Yeah, so that, that's a great and uh, very broad, broad question. I mean, so, so technological advance in, in uh, quantitative social science is very dear to my heart. And that's why part of why I started this development data lab and, and we've invested so much in this. I mean, just think of the, the so the Indian government has never, um, never ever released comprehensive religion data below the sub-district, right? And, um, that makes it very difficult to study exactly these issues of religious segregation and, and an unequal provision of public goods and so on. Um, you know, this was enabled, our analysis was enabled by the fact that A, we were able to find some data that was actually identified down to the enumeration block level, but also that we were able to classify all of these names uh, according to religion. We're in the process of trying to do it according to caste. It's a lot harder. There are a lot of names that are really caste ambiguous. Um, and so, uh, but, but religion is pretty clear, um, but it's only these technological advances in machine learning, as well as getting access to these data that have allowed us to actually go and do this high quality classification. And in fact, if we hadn't been able to get access to the railway exam taker names and religious classifications, we wouldn't have even been able to, to do this classification at all because we need some sort of training data set. So, I mean, I see very, very, I see a ton of potential for, um, for sort of better data to, to illuminate a lot of these issues. Um, one thing that I'm very keen on is in trying to see if we can put together rich private sector data, um, like Raj Chetty and co-authors at, at um, Opportunity Insights have done in the United States. I think that their, what they did during the pandemic reveals that in, on many, many, many issues, actually the private sector knows a lot more than the government. Um, you know, the government comes out with survey, like a census every 10 years, even when it does the national sample survey, it's only a sample survey and we don't know exactly where people live or the characteristics of those neighborhoods. Um, we, we don't see them over time. Um, but, you know, as more and more economic activity and life is conducted uh, online, um, we basically have the potential, if we can find ways of putting together data from different sources, to know more and more about people's lives. For example, one thing that's being studied in the US is um, daytime versus nighttime segregation. Right? So we have no way of knowing that from the kind of data that we have. But when you have information on everybody and you know who they are and you know from their cell phone records where they're spending, you know, where they live based on where they are at night and, and where they work and shop based on where they are during the day or their check-ins to different locations through Google Maps or whatever, um, then you can actually like really characterize in a much richer way how segregated we are 
in consumption, how segregated we are in our workplaces, how segregated we are in our in our residences, um, all of which are interesting, but you can only study when you have that richer data. So yeah, I think there's huge potential out there. Um, I have not made a whole lot of progress in getting these kinds of richer data sources in India, but but uh, hope springs eternal. And uh, I know you have to go. We, uh, we have just uh, one minute. Very quick uh, last question from Taha Rao of, from University of Michigan. Do you control for any historical variables such as trade routes or religious institutions? So we don't control for these things. I think, you know, so, okay, so I should mention that for all the papers that, that I write, uh, we try to put out publicly available data that basically allows people to take the analysis further than we've been able to, and um, or just check our work. Um, and so we will be releasing just a massive amount of this data um, in the pretty near future so that people can ask a lot of richer questions. I think one set of questions is, why is it that some places are so much more segregated than others? And there is certainly work suggesting that places for example, that had more historical trade exposure, experienced less communal violence um, in more recent decades. Um, there's a lot of this kind of work that I think could really take forward. It, it's still gonna be descriptive because we still only have segregation in the cross section in 2012, but that can really take forward our understanding of, of some of the potential historical causes of the patterns that we see. Um, so we haven't actually done that. I, I think we're kind of grappling with where to cut off this paper in the first place and probably have too much going on already. Um, but I really hope that, that people take exactly these kinds of questions forward um, and do get in touch if you're interested in this stuff. Well, Sam, we are exactly at 1.15. I know you have to go, but thank you so much. And I hope we can have you back again soon as you as progress Absolutely. further on this. Absolutely. Thanks so much for the invitation. This was great. Great. Thank you all like, for joining.